Our favorite tool for entrepreneurs podcast will address tools that are useful to startups and existing businesses. We will also cover other aspects of the launch and growth of entrepreneurial ventures. Your two hosts will be Professor Gary Palin and serial entrepreneur Ryan Budden. I'm Professor Gary Palin. Yeah, and I'm Ryan Budden. This podcast is valuable to entrepreneurs in both launch and growth modes. That's absolutely right. We'll go over some tools, get you into hyper growth mode. How can we see some hockey stick growth in your business? Well, welcome, Louis Sheets, uh, the director of the Chavis Center for Entrepreneurship at St. Louis University. And Louis is uh, a former colleague of mine. And also, Ryan, I don't know if you know this, uh, Louis is a former student of mine. So you two I have something that. in common. Yeah. We've and been through the ringer together. <laughs> Imagine how old he must be, Ryan. <laughs> that's, that's a fact. Well, I, I, now I can say uh, you, you're my second and third favorite students of all time. <laughs> now, you might ask, who's my favorite? Well, my, da my daughter-in-law is my favorite. <laughs> I have a grandson. <laughs> you're not going to top that either of you. <laughs> that's pretty well, high-ranking. I'll take it. Well, Louis, you, uh, you've been involved with teaching entrepreneurship for many years, and I'm sure you've heard people say, ask you the question, can entrepreneurship be taught? And some people are making the statement they believe that it can't be taught. What's your thought on that? Can it be taught? Man, I hope so. Yeah, of course it can, right? I mean, lots of ways that we teach entrepreneurship to young um, students in a uh, university setting, um, high school setting, but even way beyond the college environment, we, we've proven that we can teach entrepreneurship. Well, and obviously, I agree with you, having spent many years in uh, as a professor of entrepreneurship, and I know Ryan's on board with that. But now the question is, how should it be taught? Because that's always up for debate, and it's been, it's been shifting over the years. Yeah, I mean, so I'm a big believer in learning through experience, and, with, and I've built a model on experiential learning around entrepreneurship. So learning while doing, essentially. Um, entrepreneurship, there's not a direct plan A through B, C, D. And that's why it is tough to teach entrepreneurship and it's tough to learn, but we can do it. We create ambiguity for students, put them in an environment to learn hands-on and understand and teach them to think. It's really about thinking like an entrepreneur and then putting them in a position to be able to apply that. Well, you've created a very interesting model with experiential learning. Would you mind describing it? Sure thing. Yeah, basically, um, we stole the hospital teaching model and we applied it to entrepreneurship education. Uh, so this clinical model of teaching entrepreneurship is, if you look at the hospital teaching model, we put a student beside a doctor or nurse and we let them operate on a patient. What we did was replace the doctor and nurse with an entrepreneur and we replaced the patient with a real company. And doing that, we were able to engage students in this experiential learning model where they can see what's really happening, whether it's a two-person firm or a 2,000-person firm that thinks entrepreneurial, we can put them in that situation and let them learn through that process. Um, we do this in four and eight-week chunks um, so we can prevent procrastination. We create uh, scarcity of resources, mainly time for students, and, and, and then teach them what they're seeing and ha have them apply it to their concepts and their moving forward. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I, I like that you focus on the mentality part of it. While they're in those programs, do you have some, some specific tools that you really like using? Yeah, I mean, there's some of the general tools like um, like the business model canvas. We use a, a version of that. We, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a spreadsheet guy. So I live in Excel and I think students should understand the importance of projections and understanding what the guts of the business are. And Excel is a great tool for that. Um, uh, there's another one that, uh, that I'm skipping. Uh, the, lean, the lean startup model, like we, using some of the principles for get, getting students to think fast and fail fast and move forward. What would you say are the benefits of a student uh, studying entrepreneurship uh, versus right out of, say, high school starting and launching a business? What, what would be the trade-offs? Um, there's a lot, right? So let's start with, I think the biggest one is learning through others' experiences, right? Entrepreneurship is not easy. It's worth it, but there's a difference. It's not, it, there's a difference. It's not easy. And 
to help accelerate that chance of success, being able to learn through others is a great tool, right? So in a classroom, whether it be in a high school entrepreneurship program or, or a university entrepreneurship program, you can eliminate some of the mistakes that others have made. It's really why I got I began teaching in the first place. Obviously, Gary knows this story. He invited me to co-teach a class 20 plus years ago. And the first company I started, I made a ton of mistakes. I didn't know what I was doing. I was young and an idiot, basically, but I just had to, to build something. When, when I started teaching, I realized I could help students avoid some of those easy mistakes that I made just because of lack of experience. We can create that experience in the college environment or high school environment, so that doesn't happen. And we can help you know, push them upward and then create an even a better chance of success by using the resources of the university, the brand, space, tools, data, people, and then put them in even a better chance of success. So I think that's really one of the, the key components. The other piece is entrepreneurship can be really, really lonely. Um, it's not a one person game and a university setting can help you really identify who should be on the team. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a classmate. Oftentimes it is, but it could be alumni, it could be faculty, it could be supporters of the university. So your network starts to grow really quickly if you get embedded in that ecosystem, which also leads to your pathway of success. So a lot of people look at entrepreneurship as kind of a, a get rich quick. I'm going to be my own boss. Can you talk about timing of this? Have you seen the time that it takes people to be successful? How many failures that go through before something successful happens? Yeah, I, I haven't found that magic get rich quick uh, scheme yet. I, I, <laughs> I've looked, I haven't seen it. Like entrepreneurship is about sacrifice. It's about hard work. It's about grit. It's about perseverance. Um, now, we read about the sexy entrepreneurial success stories, right? Because that's what you know, that's what press does, right? We, you you got to get readers, so you write about either the really bad ones or the really good ones, where most of us are going to live in the middle, right? We're going to create value. We're going to create impactful companies, but only a few are going to be the, the unicorns, and hopefully only a few are really the the flame outs, not, not just failures, but the flame outs, like think Ther uh, Theranos, for example. So it's, it's about um, have, making those sacrifices, keeping at it, really pushing forward and learning from the people around you. It's really where that worth comes versus the easy. It's an interesting point you brought up, Brian, because I, I don't think I've ever met anyone that started a business with the sole motivation of becoming wealthy ever become wealthy because <laughs> they, they give up because it's so darn hard. They give up before they, they get there because it is a long road. You know, that's that overnight path to success will take you 10, 15 years very often. The, and also the, this is an area I'd like to ask you about Lewis uh, that I've noticed there's, it seems to be in today's uh, students, a greater fear of failure than I'd seen in the past. And failure is embedded in entrepreneurship. Uh, what are your thoughts with, with the trends of, of failure and students' perspectives today and how important the concept of failure is? Yeah, it's interesting, like, especially in a university environment. I mean, we're, we're built, we, we build a system based on grades, right? And students come to university, they don't come to university to get an F. Like nobody mm -hmm. signs up and pays tuition so they can get an F. So it's sort of naturally built into, you've got to, earn good grades and succeed, right? And we put artificial caps on GPAs and all, all these other restrictions around this system. And then at the same time, when you, you've got entrepreneurship professors like me and you and say, failure is okay, right? So there, there is a conflict that happens when students are approaching that. So it part of it is explaining what are you being graded on, right? So failing at an opportunity or, or concept is one thing, failing at not showing up is another thing, right? So redefining what failure means, right? If you fail because you just gave up, then yeah, you failed, right? You, and, you, and you're not gonna learn much from that. If you fail because you, you didn't identify a product market fit, the timing wasn't right, you didn't have the right team, like all these other things, but you learn the reason I failed were because pro lack of product market fit, timing, wrong team, then that's a success for me, right? 
And I think you'll see that across the country, entrepreneurship professors sort of embrace that. I, I'm a big fan of embrace ambiguity and embrace failure, right? Learn from those two things. You're going to be better off than most of the world, right? You're going to be better off than your peers if you really lean into the, those components, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship. So I feel like as the, the young guy on the call here, as we've clearly got a lineage of teaching going on, I, I can ask age, Ron. I don't know what, what how you made that assumption. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I'm uniquely qualified to ask this. How has the field of entrepreneurship changed? I mean, just in my time, it seems like it's gone from how do you operate a small business to how do we get into unicorn status? Yeah, I, I, there's a there's a few things that come to mind for me. Like when I first started teaching. And Gary and I co-taught that class. Like it was really heavily focused on writing a business plan. I mean, I mean, re- literally, we'd have students print out and bond business plans back then. Versus today, like nobody reads those. So why are we making them write them? Um, so that whole flip to, um, especially what the way I approached this was flipping away from launching new companies to developing students. So instead of developing a concept, develop a student, mm-hmm. and that really drives this entrepreneurial mindset versus launching a company. And from a from a teacher standpoint, professor standpoint, it gives so much more reach, right? So you can have a student that's really passionate about developing a lifestyle business or a hobby type business that's going to be one or two people. That's cool. Entrepreneurship applies to that. But you can also have that student that really wants to create a high growth scalable company that works as well. With the mindset, you can with that entrepreneurial mindset, you can also apply that to I want to go work at Google or I want to go work at Under Armour, you know, a large corporation or in St. Louis, Boeing, for example, huge com- company, not a new venture by any means, but they're looking for entrepreneurially minded graduates to come in and create value and, and create impact in those companies. So I think I know personally for me, that's one of the biggest shifts, right? It's not about launching a company. Most 22-year-olds shouldn't launch a company, in all honesty, because they haven't really identified a great concept worth pursuing. What they should do is launch their careers. Some of them will be companies, but most of them are going to go join other company, other ex- existing firms. For me, is that what has changed is teaching students to think that way as an entrepreneur and then applying that wherever they might land. Yeah, I would agree with you 100%, Lois. Just the... Uh... The majority of students with the uh, pursuing a degree or achieving a degree in entrepreneurship never launch a business. And in all honesty, most of them should not. That's not who they are. That's not what their desires are. But that thought process is just extremely powerful. And I know I'm continually finding uh, employers looking for that entrepreneurial minded student. Yeah, no doubt. The concept of intrapreneurship versus entrepreneurship. Yeah, that term is definitely floated around. I, I, I like to use the term entrepreneurship, but very general in terms of inside of company, outside of company, social, non-social, like entrepreneurship is really a way of thinking and, a, and action, right? So being able to recognize an opportunity and validate it, understand how to create value, and then articulate it to the right stakeholders, whether that be investors, your boss, customers, team members, it's really that whole wraparound. And you can put that in basically anywhere, nonprofit, for-profit, mm-hmm. you know, government, non-government. There's a, there's a, and we've got a ton of proof of it. We have 20 plus years of students going out into the world with this entrepreneurial mindset and making an impact. Now, you mentioned one of my favorite words, both in uh, my pedagogy and also the, probably the greatest resistance I, I receive from students is the word ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Uh, how important is, is it for the students to become, or anyone launching a business, to become very comfortable with ambiguity? Yeah, I, 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 it's probably the most essential piece of, of entrepreneurship. Like when you think about a concept, the most essential piece is product market fit, right? You, if you build something nobody wants that you didn't really do anything, you just built a cool widget. But in terms of survival, embracing ambiguity is it, right? I I learned that from my grandfather, actually, many years ago, he was a farmer and he talked about every day is different. And he really didn't know what that day was. He had a plan, right? He knew what he had needed to get done that day, but he also recognized that those plans, although might have good intentions, were not likely to actually be in the, in, as he laid them out, it might rain, the tractor broke, 
you know, somebody doesn't show up, it's too hot. Like those things are going to happen. And in entrepreneurship, that really applies. And I always think about those stories he talks about, like he might get up and think he's going to just plow a field, but then he ends up having to drive two and a half hours to get apart for a tractor. And that's just, you, you, you embrace it and you deal with it. In entrepreneurship, it's the same way. You get a customer that you don't match expectations. Someone doesn't um, show up. You over or underestimate a need. You have to be able to be prepared for that and be able to move forward. Most people will just quit. And that's that's a big difference between that sacrifice and grit versus I've got a cool idea. I'm going to talk about it for 20 years and not do anything about it. Yeah, the farm concept's interesting, Lewis. I've, I've uh, read that people that grow up in a small farm environment, they tend to have a higher probability of success in entrepreneurship. And one of the big reasons is they know how to make things work with minimal resources. Yeah, yeah. Scarcity, right? You know, you, you're li living it. No matter what type of entrepreneurship you end up going in, you're going to have limited resources. We all have limited resources. If nothing else, it's time. But limited resources apply to money, access to uh, materials, people. It's about making the most of those limited resources. And farming is a great example of being able to do that, right? Um, so, yeah. And it's also close to my heart. So it's, it's meaningful that way, too. So I'm, I'm sure everybody listening to this is, has caught two things that you guys have said. One, people in their 20s probably shouldn't launch a business. <laughs> and the second is most people studying entrepreneurship never will. So it brings up the question, how do you know when you've got an idea that's worth pursuing? Yeah, I, so for me, let me, let me clarify. Most students should not launch a company at 22. That is most, not all. Like we've had great success stories of students in college starting companies and being successful. Um, most students aren't going to launch a company. That's okay too, because they can still be entrepreneurial in these firms. The question goes back to how do you know when? And it really goes back to customer discovery. If you think about the traditional STEM focused student, they, they're typically driven by building something cool, right? Whether engineering, electrical, mechanical, civil, they're typically thinking about building something cool and we sort of train them to do that. They build something cool, but then they don't know who wants it or how to commercialize it. And it creates this vacuum. It sort of sits on a shelf and dies. On the other side of campuses, we have these business-minded students that we're teaching them to recognize opportunities and they don't necessarily know how to build the widget. So we have this void that happens. What, if you really have something, you'll know it because of the feedback from the customer. And it's gotta be enough customers to make it worthwhile, right? You can't have one customer that's really passionate and say, cool, I'm gonna build a company unless you can, you know, other than the government, you can't really live off of one customer, right? You need to be able to have more than one customer. And so identifying enough customers that are really in need or passionate about it and having that product market fit through customer discovery leads you to knowing it's the right time to launch that company. Until you have that, um, it's not. And, and going back to the original question, can you teach entrepreneurship? Like that's a big part of it, teaching students what customer discovery is, how to do it, how to learn from it, how to digest it, how to analyze the data and then use it to their benefit is huge. And you can learn that in a classroom from a professor and from other entrepreneurs. And if you just try to do that on your own, it's gonna take a lot longer. You're gonna make a lot of mistakes. Yeah, and I would add in, into that, it's, it's who they are. Because I, I can uh, still remember, you're gonna find this hard to believe, I, where both of you sat in class. And, and Lewis, we're talking 30 years ago. But uh, that it was the types of questions, and I identified who you were entrepreneurs. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Lewis Ryan had a, a position at Xerox. He came running into my office. He was very excited about it. And I said, sit down. We have to talk. And I knew he wasn't going to be happy in a major corporation. And, yeah. and Ryan, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, I mean, that you've, you've nailed the story. I actually accepted a role at Xerox <clears throat> out of college and came into Professor Palin's office to tell him that, I, you know, I, this is what I was, I was excited about it. I was going to be going to work there. And the quick analogy was, have you ever spent a week in your car? And I had actually, we had something at Elon University called fake break. So I had just done a road trip with a buddy of mine and it was 10 days. So roughly a week. So I you know, quickly responded. Yeah. And he asked me a follow-up question, which was, was it, was it pretty bad? 
said, no, it was, it was, it was, you know, kind of exciting for a week. He said, well, right now, if you fail, that's your worst case scenario. It'll probably take you a week to get back on your feet to some degree. Yeah. He said, if you do that same, if you try and start a venture a year from now, it's probably you and your girlfriend in the car. And that's a little worse. Two years from now, it's you, your girlfriend, and your dog, a little worse. Three years, it's you, your wife, and your dog, even worse. You, your wife, and your kid makes it unbearable. Yeah. And I, I really took that, you know, as kind of the analogy and grabbed the bull by the horns, and here we are. Never taken a real job since. <laughs> yeah, Gary, and I think a lot of light from this aspect, and not, not surprisingly, right? It's one of the things that I think drives both of us, I know it drives both of us, is really about moving that opportunity closer to where you have the least, you have the least to lose, right? And, and your example is exactly right, right? If you fail as a 22 year old, you have a very short amount of time to make up for it, right? Versus failing as a 52 year old, you've probably gained a lot of assets over time, people in your life, and failing takes a lot longer to recover from. So putting students in a position to understand and, and learn from that and then be able to relaunch is a great um, opportunity for students. Now, some, someone listening may think that what we just said is contrary because I gave Ryan advice to go forward with his ventures and we're saying not to do it at 22. But that was the distinction I was trying to make. It was who Ryan was. I would not give that advice to most students. Yeah, right. And I think I think that's where the argument that comes out where people ask, can you teach entrepreneurship or can you not? Well, that's, I don't think that's the right question, right? Obviously we can teach entrepreneurship and you can be born with entrepreneurship, right? It's not an either or, right? You can be born an entrepreneur and you can be taught to be an entrepreneur. And if you're born an entrepreneur, you can be taught to be a better entrepreneur. And that's where the impact really comes into play, right? I was born an entrepreneur. I was the one mowing grass when I was 10 years old, I, you know, collected shells and sold them at the beach, or I'd take stuff from my sister and resell it to her. Like I was always that entrepreneurial spirit hustler type uh, mindset to, to build and create value. I didn't go to school for that. But when I did go to school for that, I recognized like, oh, that, I'm not that weird, right? It's not, it's not that bad of a thing to sort of think this way. And now I can apply it to something that can be impactful. I can create a better life for my family, especially at that time point. Like I can use this and I can do it better than if I tried to do it on my own. And, and that's really where the, all these pieces come together. Yes, you can teach entrepreneurship. Yes, you can, be a, you can be born an entrepreneur. You can become a better entrepreneur by learning how to think like an entrepreneur. Sorry, yeah, I really picked up tools. I, I would say I, I was a <clears throat> kid as well finding people in the apartment complex that needed odd jobs, asking anybody and everybody what I could do, getting really after it. And now I've learned some tools to make sure what I'm doing is, is constructive and not just hustling around the complex to figure out what needs to happen. How do you make it sustainable? I think is. Yeah, totally. totally. One of the more common uh, aspects that I hear from young people that are truly entrepreneurs is what you just touched on very often they will say to me, I thought I was strange. I thought I was different. Then I met other entrepreneurs and I was like, Eureka, there are other people like me. Yeah. And I want to slide into Lewis asking about the, an entrepreneurial ecosystem where you have like-minded people involved. How important is that? And do you, do you encourage students? Do you develop those types of uh, relationships? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's one of my three components, right? One is engaging students in entrepreneurial education I'm sorry, experiential, engaging students in experiential learning through entrepreneurship education. The second component is embedding them in the ecosystem because I mentioned this earlier, entrepreneurship can be really lonely at times. And part of that loneliness is driven by you either don't know what question to ask or you don't know who to ask. And it leads to this spinning in place, right? You're just sort of figuring, trying to figure out. So you just spin and spin and spin. But being embedded in an ecosystem that time frame shortens very dramatically. So the clinical model, we actually built the first one in a co-working space in downtown Raleigh when I was at North Carolina State. And we're replicating the positives of that at uh, St. Louis University. And we're purposely building that off of campus in the ecosystem. So in a co-working space where students are rubbing elbow, elbows and connecting with entrepreneurs every day. You can't avoid it, right? You're in that space. 
So the that spinning ends up spinning forward. So instead of spinning in place, you start spinning forward because within minutes you could be talking to someone that's gone through a similar problem or thinks a little differently that gives you advice to, to spin you forward. And we create this really cool shortening of that learning curve and put the students in a better place to succeed. The other things that start happening are you build out better networks of potential team members, customers, investors, advocates for you personally or advocates for your company, right? So now your story starts to spread. You have a better chance of success because you get in front of those customers. So like trying to do, trying to be an entrepreneur on your own is one, lonely and not fun. And it's really painful because it's harder to succeed. You need customers to be successful and being in that ecosystem really helps that out. Speaking of that ecosystem, Gary and I often talk about teammates. How do you build your direct ecosystem you're working with? And it's a really complicated and, and diff difficult equation to map out. Do you have any suggestions for someone that's looking at it, you know, going alone and looking at it, looking to build a teammate? Where can they even start? So let, let me break that question up in two parts, right? So first, identifying the teammates. I think about think about it from two aspects, right? I need to complement my weaknesses. So I'm going to look for what I'm what I'm weak at and and find teammates that will help complement that, right? So that's their strength. That's one. That's the first sort of thing I've got to be thinking about. But I think the second piece, which cannot be underestimated, is you need to work with people you like working with, right? Because it's so difficult in the early stages of launching a company. What you don't need is like extra baggage of personalities clashing all the time, right? So strengths, I'm when I talk about strengths and weaknesses, I'm, I'm thinking more about skill sets. But I also think the personality matches really matter, right? Because you're more willing to, you know, put in those extra hours, burn the candle at a, both ends, if you're committed to that other person because you have that connection, right? So I think those two are really the driving forces for me. Like, who do I like to work with and how do they complement my weaknesses? How do you find those people is you gotta get out of, you gotta get out of the building, right? You can't be hanging out in your office the whole time trying to build those connections. You gotta show up at events. You gotta show up in the places like universities where we're developing talent, or if you're a university student, show up in the, at the events that the programs are putting on. So you're starting to meet like kind people or people that are interested. At good universities like St. Louis, for example, we purposely create an environment where we'll get students from across the entire campus. Entrepreneurship should not be just inside a room, inside a business school or inside a room, inside a STEM engineering school, for example. It's gotta be across the entire campus if you're gonna really be successful and make an impact. So if, at SLU, for example, we're building programs where we get med students and law students and engineers and public state, uh, um, public health students and business students all showing up at the same time at the same place to help them really build out that network so they know who could be really good teammates. It's not necessarily about coming up with a great concept to launch a company. It's more about building out that network for them so they can build off of each other, share ideas, learn from each other. So if that concept does come about, they're going to be in a better place of success. And if it doesn't, they've got a really good network of people that they can rely on as they continue through their career. And maybe that concept comes five years, 10 years, or 20 years later, that network is going to be instrumental in being able to, to launch those companies whenever they might happen. Lewis, one of the uh, perceived obstacles that I hear, and I use the word perceived very specifically, is I would start this business, but I don't have enough money. If I could just get the financing, I could build it and succeed. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, that's, that's BS, right? So <laughs> the, the, the reason companies fail, nine out of 10 is product market fit, meaning you're building something somebody doesn't want. That's, that's why you run out of money, right? You, you built something somebody doesn't want, you run out of money because you can't get to the point where you build something they want. So if you focus on that customer discovery and that product market fit, and you build something that enough people want, funding's not an issue. It's just not, right? If you build a great widget and you can prove that a lot of people want it, then you can raise money. The question is, do you want to build a hobby business or you want to build a scalable business? Because if you want to build a hobby business, you're not going to go raise a million dollars from venture capital 
because there's no ROI. There's no chance for them to get that recovery because you're you're thinking up from a hobby business. There's nothing wrong with any of those levels, right? There's nothing wrong with building a really cool hobby business, but recognize the limitations of how you're going to fund that. The best way to fund a company, especially a hobby business, is through sales. Go sell something. Go sell it to a, one of your customers. Get them to pay for it. Even if you haven't completed it yet, if you're really building something people want, they'll lean into it, right? And going back to customer discovery, you can prove a lot of things without spending a lot of money. I use this example. I gave a presentation this morning and use this example of a student that wanted to build a food truck. Well, one way is just go build a food truck. Well, that's not a really smart way to, to test the if the customer if there's customer fit, right? Because you spend a lot of money and time investing in that food truck. The other way is to create an environment where you can see if people really want or are interested in this food and if they'll go to where you think you can park the food truck, right? So stand on the corner, pass out menus, tell them it's around the corner, track how many people go around the corner looking for the food truck. Then go talk to them and ask them, what got you excited about it? What does that cost you? Other than time, it's a couple pennies for print. Like it's not that expensive. So funding is not the problem if you truly have product market fit. If you don't, you're right. You're going to run out of money and money is a problem because you don't have any, but it's not a problem if you truly understand what you're building for the right customer. Well, Lewis, I appreciate you taking time to uh, share your insights and your experiences. You've made a remarkable impact on entrepreneurship education, and I'm very proud of you. I appreciate the kind words, and uh, I'm very thankful for my uh, origin story, which you were definitely part of. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, much for your time today. I, I really think there's some golden tidbits out of there. I hope so, and uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, It's been a blast. And have a great day. And you can go play uh, basketball with Einstein. You got it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to our favorite tools for entrepreneurs with Professor Gary Palin and Ryan Budden. We hope you enjoyed this deep dive into topics that assist with the launch and growth of your entrepreneurial venture. As always, you can head over to profspirit.com to check out more resources and courses designed for you, the entrepreneur. Also, please follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube to get the most up-to-date information as it is released.